Hi everybody, this is Muslims Collaborify with the Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition. My name is Fatima Sadiqwa. I'm the Census Fellow for the Coalition. This is Maria Farah. Please introduce yourselves. Hi, my name is Maria Mozafar and I am the Director of Advocacy and Policy at the Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition. And I am Farah Kazi. I'm a private lawyer, an immigration and international human rights lawyer at Kazi Law Offices. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Sure. Well, uh, we did a show for advocacy and policy just a couple few episodes ago, and uh, we had told the leadership at the coalition that what I would really like to have this time is have an immigration attorney that really knows um, the current trends in immigration right now, is dealing with the case law up in front, that is dealing with the refugee community and dealing with children, and I couldn't think of a better person than Farah Kazi. So I'm excited for you to talk to Farah Kazi and, and have Farah introduce herself and about her work. Thank you first for having me. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, I, I think I would probably start by saying that obviously the immigration process or the immigration law is, is, uh, is a pertinent topic that is prevalent in every conversation that we're having right now. So I think um, when you talk about when you talk about immigration law or you talk about my immigration practice, you have to start from the very beginning. And the idea that came from from that practice was that I always wanted to help people. I always wanted to build communities and I wanted to work in some sort of civic capacity but also as an attorney as well. So I tried to meld all of those passions into one thing and um, I was naturally inclined towards international human rights and then quickly learned that we have an immigration crisis right here within this country and I really don't have to go very far in order to help the people that I was trying to help and so um, when in the last couple of years when we had you know one crisis after another in particular with the Muslim ban and then um, after that with migrant crisis I became even more vociferous and very very vocal about my um, my support for immigrants and for refugees um, cases. And I think what's really important and interesting about Farah is that she serves as an example of someone who obviously has the legal skills and expertise because she has clients um, that are going through the immigration process right now, but she also has a non-for-profit. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'd love for you to talk about that and how kind of I would how do you meld love together? Love to. So, so really, what happened is that um, all of these kind of take. You know, it's it's funny. Sometimes people talk about the tra trajectory of your career, and it's it's weird how sometimes just things kind of fall into place without you actually necessarily planning it to be that way. And so, like I said, from a very young age, I knew that I wanted to work with refugees, with asylees, and with the immigrant community. It was something that I was just naturally gifted towards and naturally inclined to um, to study and I had just a, an empathy for, for their cause. So um, I just didn't know how to fit it all in along with the community service that I wanted to do and all the other you know, different passions that a person might have. So um, through the course of developing my firm, I realized that I wanted to develop my own firm particularly because I want to be able to take on the cases that I want to and be able to do pro bono work and low bono work and community service work. So I did all of that and with each case, they wouldn't just come just for legal help, they would come because they would also need therapists or they would need help advocacy within a school or they wouldn't know how to drive and they would ask me for recommendations. How do I get around? How do I do? And I started to realize, all right, we've got a bigger problem here. You know, I'm not just their lawyer right now. I'm kind of their go-to for everything. Mm -hmm. So um, so a friend of mine, Hannah Reza, and I, we both decided that we were going to start another organization called Ripple. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also started it in conjunction with my children, so they are on uh, the junior board as well and we do a lot of community service within our local community in particular in Aurora and Naperville area um, in the western suburbs and we seek out families particularly refugee families but really any families and we have quite a few now that are not necessarily refugee or immigrant but are just struggling many of them are single mothers and we provide them with groceries with rental assistance with um, a lot of things with schools, so school supplies, and we go into local schools and try to help with lunch balances and books and, and whatever they might need. So um, we're a resource available and people have kind of found out about us and they, they come and they ask us for very specific needs. And one of our biggest events is that we do a big Thanksgiving dinner every year. Um, right before Thanksgiving, we have usually more than 100 people that show up and we provide them with a meal and gifts and, and um, you know, just a chance to bond. Incredible. That's wonderful. You were talking about some of the challenges that, um, you know, immigrants face today and refugees face today. Can you talk a little bit about how difficult the immigration process is? 
So the immigration process varies depending on whatever the case might be, right? Mm -hmm. But but generally speaking, it is a very difficult, I mean, it, it was always a difficult process. It's become even more arduous with this new administration because we have a lot of limitations and setbacks, particularly with delays. So even let's say that if they were able to get an attorney, which first is expensive and, and hard to do, and many times they don't know where to go. So let's, let's start there. So first they have to get legal representation. And the reason why they have to get legal representation is because the statistics have shown that Without legal representation, almost every single one of them will be removed or deported. <clears throat> so legal representation will increase your chances by 40 to 50 percent, at least at least for you to get your chance in court and actually have your, your story heard. And most of these people have really harrowing stories that really do need to be heard. But, you know, they show up at court without legal representation. They might not get translators. They don't understand the process. Wow. They don't understand what their rights are. They might wave away their rights without even realizing it. Um, they might sign forms without recognizing what those forms are about. And while they are supposed to be provided with translators, they are not always provided with them. And so we have a lot of people, for example, in my, in my practice, a good majority of them are from the Latino community, and so many of them only speak Spanish, and they were, you know, they'll come to my office with a <coughs> bunch of forms, um, all in English, mm -hmm. and they've signed them. Oh, gosh. And so now I have to now <coughs> go back and backtrack and do my best to try to reopen their case and say, look, they didn't, they have no idea what they signed. So that's one thing. So first, getting legal representation. There's also a real problem that we have within the communities, which is of people who are pretending to be lawyers mm -hmm. and then pretending to give legal advice. We have a big problem, particularly in the Latino community of notarios. They are people that are, you know, they are local people that are essentially taking advantage of their own community oh, members wow. and telling them that, oh, we'll fill out this form or fill out that form for you, taking thousands upon thousands of hard-earned money and then messing up their cases and arranging, you know, uh, essentially arranging for them to be removed. So, um, so that you know, those are some challenges, and then there's so many more within this administration. We have um, a very concerted effort to create a lot of delays. So even if we were to get all of the paperwork taken care of and then we send it in, almost every single one of them will be returned back to us for something. And it will be something inconsequential. But when they return it, then they don't include the original filing date. And in asylum law, for example, which is a predominant practice that I have, you have to file for asylum within one year of entry. So that, those delays could cost you your entire That's case. Right. So let me um, ask you, you know, um, there was a case that you had um, brought to the public's attention about a little girl in oh, a yes. detention center. Could you talk a little bit about that? So that was one of our most, um, I mean, we've had so many just in this past year alone, but mm -hmm. that was one of our probably our most um, emotional case. It was of a young father and a, and a girl who was two years old who fled, literally fled with whatever they had on their backs. Um, from Honduras and the reason was because he was trying to he was being recruited by a gang and he was refusing mm -hmm. and um, this is a very very common issue um, within Latin America and because he refused the gang then started sending him pictures of his little girl and saying that they were going to kidnap her so um, she's two years old he had no choice he really he said I you know I looked into other options there's no way for me to get the police involved because the police are often in the back pockets of those gangs and um, in the middle of the night, he just mm -hmm. packed her up and he took her. And he fled from Honduras, went through Guatemala, went to Mexico, got to the border over here. When he finally got here, you can imagine the condition that they were in because they're, you know, running for their lives. Um, got here, asked for asylum, got to the border, got to a detention center, was with his daughter. And within a very short period of time, one of the agents told him that, you know, we want you to come to court with us, um, but you can't bring your daughter. Oh. So he was very reluctant, <coughs> obviously, and asked several questions. And they said, no, no, don't worry about it. You'll see you in a few hours. You just are going to go before the judge. So he, he said goodbye to his daughter. He went what he thought was going to court. He actually got into a bus and um, was taken to a prison. And his daughter was shuttled to a detention center for unaccompanied minors. So now we're talking about, for people that don't know, so we're talking about we're family separation. We're talking now. about family separation now. Okay. So what we have here, and this is something that a lot of people don't realize, is that when you have, the way that the system is structured right now is that they have a system for unaccompanied minors 
whether those people actually came with a parent or a guardian or not. They all get lumped into the same category. So this girl actually had come through with her father, mm -hmm. but was still lumped in the category of an unaccompanied minor, mm -hmm. which you can already perceive what the problem would be. So now they're acting as if she was abandoned and that she may or may not be eligible to be placed in a foster care system or to remain indefinitely within the detention center. Um, we have something called the Flores Agreement here, and we are not supposed to leave children into a detention center for more than 72 hours without some sort of process that's taking place, and then in particular for 20 days after that, or 29 days depending on your, on your interpretation. She stayed in that for seven months. Wow. So, and she was only brought out because, quite literally, I threw a fit. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no other way to explain it. I, you know, contacted every single person I could. I contacted representatives. I threatened media. I uh, essentially harassed them until they would release this little mm -hmm. girl. Um, and one of the problems that we have with the family separation, among many others, is that in order for a child to be released, they have to be released to a U.S. citizen. So you can imagine once again that if somebody is fleeing for their lives and they're coming here, they might not necessarily have a family member or somebody that they trust, first of all, and second of all, if that person is available to be an, a U.S. citizen, and then that U.S. citizen then has to have the finances and the three years of tax reports to show that they can financially support. And they just may not so have it's paperwork. one roadblock after another after another. So let's talk a little bit about, I'm sure, Fatima, you've heard this too, you know, um, our Congresswoman Lauren Underwood had, had also made a lot of um, issue about the trauma that children feel. Of we course. all know, yes. you know, I mean, um, doctors, psychologists, psychiatrists, you know, all of them together have stated that these kids are facing uh, permanent trauma yep. from this separation. For sure. So can you speak a little bit about what that trauma looks like, how it manifests, and then how, what are the recourses for these children? Well, we haven't provided, uh, we meaning the government, has not provided recourses for them. <clears throat> so even if they are to leave, they are almost untreated in that regard. Um, many times when you do see them, when you see them, like, for example, in the case of this little girl or in the case of some of the other minors that I've now had released um, just most recently through our firm, is you see them just tremendously quiet. Mm -hmm. They're very um, confused. They have very trouble, trouble trusting people. Um, they don't have a way to articulate what has occurred to them. And so they just kind of retreat within themselves. And you can see you know, that kind of manifesting and how that's going to create a problem in the future as mm -hmm. well. Um, one of the things that I do in our firm is that we have a list of trusted therapists and counselors, and I, I absolutely require, um, I, you know, I, I ask them repeatedly and then I, I tell them, you absolutely have to go start going to therapy. Mm -hmm. And every single one of my clients is deserving of it. Mm -hmm. so, um, so we have a good resource of, uh, you know, free clinics as well as low-cost therapists and counselors that are available to help them. But that's not always, a, it's not always an option. And many of the families are struggling, and they they can't even get their kids to the th you know they're they're in survival yeah. mode, so they yeah, can't. It's the they don't last have thing the, on their list. It's the last thing on their mind. So we definitely, I definitely see it. Um, my heart breaks for the you know for this. I have a, a young girl who was actually 18, who had just turned 18, unfortunately, and then was sent to an adult detention center, got the runaround for about eight months, separated from her mother at the border, and at 18 years old, I have seen the effects that she is suffering from now because I'm working on her asylum case. We first had to have her released from the detention center after a harrowing eight months of trying to find her, even locate her, and then get arranged for a bond hearing for her. Um, but once we did that, now she's, you know, she, her mother says she's a totally different person. She doesn't smile, she doesn't talk, she doesn't yeah. do anything, she just kind of sits there. And that affects the rest of her life. And so if that's and an 18-year-old, you can only imagine what the two-year-old yeah. so is feeling. Um, Fatima, I think, uh, I don't know, I, I think a lot of things come up when we, we talk about ICE agents, right? Mm -hmm. So can we talk a little bit about 
the interaction of ICE agents and the community, specifically your clients, and yeah. how that manifests, and how yeah, you that's help actually people really themselves. important um, PSA mm -hmm. to give out. I think a lot of people don't understand, and I give this talk quite a bit because I go into mosques and I'll go into churches and I go into schools sometimes, and I'll just kind of give these talks, um, just to know your rights, kind of a you know a short little presentation about what you actually. And almost every time I ask this question, and I say, "All right, if you have somebody come knock at your door," and they tell you that they are an ICE agent, are you? and they say that they want to come in, are you obligated to allow them to come in? And almost every time, everyone raises their hand mm -hmm. that yes, we are. Mm -hmm. And you absolutely are not. And so I think the, the key to remember here is that you need to have, you need to ask for a warrant. Mm -hmm. And you need to make sure that that warrant is signed by a judge. Mm -hmm because there are times that the warrant is shown and it's just an ICE warrant mm -hmm. or whatever. You make sure that that's signed by a judge. And even if he has the warrant and it's signed by a judge, you still have the right to ask for a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And you have the right to ask questions about why they're here and what they're doing here. So there are opportunities for you to kind of minimize the damage a little mm -hmm. bit before things get out of hand. Well, let's, let's slow down a little bit. Yeah. So, the ICE agent knocks on the door, right? And let's take the route of he does have a warrant, or okay. she does have a warrant signed by a judge, right? And he says, "So I have a right to enter your house." Mm -hmm. Okay, so how do you respond now? So there's a couple of things that you can do. First, you can say, um, you can ask them that I have an attorney, and I would like to contact that attorney. Mm -hmm. They are not supposed to deny you that right. So if it's a client of mine, I tell them immediately, give me a call. Doesn't matter what time or day, we have a service that we will provide. You can text us at any time, and I will be on the other line mm -hmm. to, to kind of guide you through it. Mm -hmm. If you're not able to do that and you allow them in, because now he has a warrant to come into your home, you still should have some sort of paper and proof of what exactly they're there for. Mm -hmm. So whether he has a warrant or not, that warrant should be very specific to what he's actually searching mm -hmm. for and who he is searching for. Mm -hmm. So let's say that he's there just for, you know, your, your son Juan. Well, then he's there for your son Juan. That doesn't mean that he should then be picking up everybody else. And asking all these questions. And all these questions and grabbing things and doing mm -hmm. whatever. So you have to be very um, careful and specific. But you can imagine that these are scared people. And they're not necessarily in the heat of the moment going to know or have the confidence to ask those questions, which is why I always say, even if you don't have a lawyer and retainer, you are able to call the ACLU, mm -hmm. you can call a civic coalition, you can mm -hmm. call not-for-profit, you can call whoever you want, keep them on your phone, on your speed dial, and have it ready so that you can continue. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I will say, and something that I see quite a bit is, and I tell the immigrant community regularly, is that I want to see powers of attorney and guardianship made for your children, mm -hmm. so that if somebody comes to your door, and the parents are then taken away, that the kids who remain are taken care of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is something that a lot of times um, are, the communities are reluctant to do because there's a lot of misinformation where they think that they're actually giving up their children or they're giving, you know, like it's an adoption right, or right, something of right. that nature, so they which need to it isn't. Mm -hmm. And so I spent a lot of time trying to explain that, and I still have met with quite a bit of resistance to it. But you would, um, I most recently had a case of a young girl who reached out to me personally, not as a lawyer, but just because she needed help um, through another group that I was part of. And she is, uh, she's 18 years old, and her she came home from work and her parents were gone mm -hmm. and her little sister had come home from school and oh there were no gosh. no parents and so she had to drop out of college because now she had to support her seven-year-old sister and she spent about three weeks eating ramen noodles because she had nowhere she didn't have the resources and the money and she also didn't know where her parents were it took them a while mm -hmm. to process it and to get to Mexico and then to be able to call her so when she called me she said you know I'm so embarrassed but I'm just so hungry oh gosh and I don't know what to do and I have this little sister and I don't know how to take care of her um, so I kind of put her in touch with like the resources that were available and there was a really great group of mothers on Facebook who just, I mean, they just came together, and this is the power of community, mm -hmm. and raised funds and started inviting them to her their home and dropping off meals for her and having them come in for dinner. And it was just a beautiful story. Um, but they were lucky that that little girl had an older sister mm -hmm. who was still able to take care of. If that little girl had been on her own, 
I don't even know what and that happens, would have happened. Right? And that happens. And it happens right. quite a bit. And so that's why I tell everyone, I said, please, please, please get your powers of attorney, get guardianship papers in check. If you are undocumented, if you are here unlawfully, there is no reason for you to have that kind of uncertainty for your you know, for your kids. Yeah. So try to get them protected. And and then tell your children. Yes. Right? That's the that's and the then tell your conversation. Children. If, exactly. if you come home from school and I'm not here. Look what to what to do. Mm -hmm. what I to mean, do. just imagine and the who type to of call. anxiety that gives a child yeah. while they're in the oh, classroom. I mean, the you know the stress you're talking about the post traumatic stress. Think about that for mm -hmm. you know for that child the mm -hmm. the issues that they might have. So, so Mario, we've talked about um, immigrant advocacy, and this has become a central plank of the coalition's advocacy. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about why um, that's so important and for Muslims today? Absolutely. I mean, I think that Farah can piggyback on this too, but we had stated in our last show that the um, largest growing population mm -hmm. of the Muslim community in Illinois is Latino, mm -hmm. actually across the country. So if people think that immigration has nothing to do with the Muslim community, that's completely incorrect. And in addition to that, the diversity of these cases are not just Latino also. They're, no. they're across. No, I mean, Afghan, I'm giving some Iraqi. examples, but we have, you know, Syrians, we've got Iraqis, we've got Afghanis, we've yeah. got uh, Pakistani, Indians. I mean, yeah. it's not it's not exclusive to one ethnicity. And I think that's really important because it's very easy for us as busy humans to kind of discount another person's suffering and say, well, it doesn't affect our community, mm -hmm. so we don't need to worry yeah. about it. And that's absolutely not the case. And I think what's also interesting, and I'm so glad you phrased the question that way, because what we really want to advocate through the coalition and all of the work that we do uh, in our different capacities is that it does not have to be a Muslim issue. I no. mean, I'm giving you information right. just to give you context, but any civil rights issue and any injustice is, should be the number one priority for Muslims living in this country, and it has been, right? This is why we've been providing social yep. services for so long, and now we're like, wait a minute, uh, we just saw a Muslim ban one and Muslim ban two. So we can not only just provide social services, no. we have to be in the forefront of legislative advocacy. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if we have time for, for Farah to kind of talk a little bit about the Muslim ban and the travel ban. It's so as relevant. A, as an immigrant I mean, it's, it's tremendously relevant and it's very important. And I will tell you that personally, it kind of galvanized me to push even harder within the immigration law field. I mean, I, the amount of CLEs, the training that I did after the Muslim ban, because I thought, all right, now this issue has really hit home. I mean, it was always an issue that I really cared about, but here I was, I'm standing at O'Hare Airport when the first Muslim ban came. And I, I went there because there was a call to action. They were asking for attorneys to come because they said there were people detained. And I said, okay, I'm gonna go. I had no clue. Um, I had never worked in detention work mm -hmm. but at that point. I had done immigration law, but I hadn't worked on detention, mm -hmm. uh, detained cases. I didn't really know what I was doing. So I went in there, and there were people from all denominations, from all backgrounds, standing outside with signs, picketing mm -hmm. and protesting. Right. And, you know, for the first time, I became, like, emotional because I said, okay, here are all these people. All of these are privileged people. It, has, it does not affect them one bit. And yet they took the time out to stand in the cold and to picket and to protest for us. Mm -hmm. And so the least that we can do is now do the same for others as well. Mm -hmm. And so when I went there, um, when I went to the, to the airport, you know, we had computers and we kind of, like, all these attorneys just sat on the floor and they just started typing and working all night trying to get these people out of detention. Mm -hmm. And again, they weren't Muslim attorneys mm -hmm. necessarily. I mean, there were a few, but the majority were just people mm -hmm. who just wanted to help. And so I always give that story because I say, okay, if, if other people can drop what they're doing and help us in our time of need, That's right. then we should be able to do the same and drop what we're doing and help others in their time of need. Mm -hmm. And the Muslim ban in particular is important because it is exactly that. It is Muslim men. Whatever semantics they want to use or whatever kind of um, sugar coating needs to be done, there, there was a very deliberate effort um, on the part of this administration to curtail the influx of mm -hmm. Muslims coming mm -hmm. into this country. And although it's not as much in the news anymore because it has been taken over by family separation and by mm -hmm. migrant crises and by children in cages and all of that, it is still a relevant problem. I have a client who has been separated from her husband now for, for five years. Um, in part and and will continue to she was already separated from him because she was going through the process of sponsoring him and now is indefinitely separated from him because 
he belongs to one of these banned mm -hmm. countries. Mm -hmm. um, and they are trying to find, you know, third countries to go to. And the, the logistics of it is just awful. You're ripping families apart. Um, and for what purpose, you know, beyond what, um, uh, beyond just curtailing, you know, immigrants. Mm -hmm. So I think if you're talking about the mm -hmm. Muslim man, I think you saw a lot of outcry among the Muslim community about it. Mm -hmm. But then it kind of died down. Because now we're like, okay, well, it's not as pertinent anymore, and now this issue. But there's families doesn't still separated, there's and still I and I think separated. that this whole story kind of exemplifies what we really, really love about people that kind of put themselves out there and answer the call. Is that yeah. you don't have to be an expert in a certain field. No, you have to literally care enough and be an expert in caring enough to show up. Right. And that is, so I mean, show that is the take home message. Honestly, in my case, I showed up. I had never done a detained case at that time. Mm -hmm. I had done it peripherally as a law student, but had never taken ownership of one. And all of a sudden, I just kind of showed up. And, and then I looked around and all the other attorneys, they didn't they had never done it either because this is an unprecedented time in our history yeah. where we were having this kind of ban and this this issue. So everyone was kind of talking to each other and just trying to figure it out. And the thing that everyone had in common was they just wanted to help. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, if that's something that's pushing somebody back and saying, oh, well, I don't really know how to help. Right. I don't know what to do. This would be your moment to say, all right, all I need is a good heart and an ability to do, you know, some good in the world. Thank you so much, Maria and Faria, for joining us today. This was Muslims Collab Collaborify with the Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition. Thank you. Thank you.